My name is Chip Ford, as Alan said. I'm the Assistant Chief of EMS here at Central Jackson County Fire Protection District. First of all, does everybody know where that is? No. Some. Blue Springs, Spring, 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 Spring Valley, Lake Tapa, Wake. So we actually are a fire department that also does EMS, and we cover all the, uh, about 85,000 people, 65 square miles. Again, Blue Springs, Green Valley, Lake Tapawingo, and some county, unincorporated county around. So there is no Blue Springs EMS or Green Valley EMS. It's the Central Jackson County. They're the yellow trucks. Okay. They're the yellow trucks and the yellow ambulances. You guys are right on 40, right? Just There's one the just down the road. Yeah, Station 1 is just down the road from you. So uh, when I was asked to do the, this, this, this uh, discussion, I thought first maybe an anatomy and physiology class would probably be appropriate. However, we've only got an hour, so we'll cut it. <laughs> no A and B? Yeah. I love A and B. Yeah. <laughs> Cadaver? We're going to bring the cadaver in here? Lab. So, um, uh, and I, this, this is a really basic list of interventions. Uh, uh, most of which is what Alan asked me to go over. I don't know if we'll get through all of these, but again, notice at the top, the vast majority of them, it says, oh, call 911. <laughs> call 911, because these are just basic first aid uh, interventions, the very beginning. And if, uh, if you forget the first basic intervention, which is call 911, um, none of these other ones a lot of times are going to be much good. So let's first talk about um, something we call acute coronary syndrome. Um, you might call a heart attack or uh, heart problems. Um, does everybody, anybody know what angina is? Angina. Anybody's dad or grandfather have chest pain? Oh, and they take a little nitroglycerin pill? Nobody? Really? It's really pretty common, and, and essentially what chest pain is, the heart's screaming for oxygen. If any of you have worked out, the next day you get a bunch of lactic acid built up in your, in your muscles, that pain, that's angina. What's happening is the heart isn't getting the oxygen it needs, lactic acid is building up, and the response is pain. It's a painful response. So folks with angina carry around little nitroglycerin pills. They put one underneath their tongue. It opens up their coronary vessels, and it allows more oxygenated blood to get to the heart. That's step one of a heart attack. If those coronary vessels aren't opened up, oxygen doesn't get to the heart, and the next step occurs, which is the heart attack. So you can have chest pain. Someone who's diagnosed with chest pain or angina, they can have chest pain and it not be a heart attack. A heart attack is step two when those vessels don't open up and actual tissue damage starts to happen. When tissue damage starts to happen, then the pump isn't, isn't as effective. So we all know that the heart fills with blood, right, and then it squeezes, and then it fills again, then it squeezes, and it fills again, and so blood goes round and round. One of the basic tenets of EMS is blood has to go round and round. The heart has to pump. Uh, oxygen is good as another tenet. Blood goes around and around, oxygen is good, and air goes in and out, so we'll stick with the blood goes around and around. It's a pump, your heart is, you can think it's a mechanical pump, and that's what it does 24 seven. It takes 60 seconds to circulate your entire blood volume for most of us, throughout our entire body. So that's a, that's a, a, a well-oiled pump, like a, a, a well-used pump, and that's one of the reasons why we focus so much on uh, heart health, is because we gotta keep it in shape so that it can pump for 60, 80, 100 years. My life expects to run at 78 years, I think. That, that's, that's a well-designed pump. So, if enough of that pump is damaged, though, because there's no oxygen getting to the tissue itself, then it, that tissue starts to die and the pump is impaired. If the pump is impaired, then it's not circulating blood, and the pump itself starts to die. So, step one is chest pain. And again, people may take a nitroglycerin if they're diagnosed with angina, and the chest pain goes away, opens up the vessel. Step two, if the vessels aren't opened up, uh, is a heart attack. And then step three is cardiac arrest. So the heart gets so damaged that it can't, the pump gets so damaged it can't pump at all, and it essentially stops. So there's a couple of different ways it stops, and the most common way an adult heart stops beating efficiently is called fibrillation. And if you if you imagine me hold, everybody knows what a burlap sack, what their burlap sack, sorry, looks like, right? If I fill it full of snakes that were really active, and I was holding this burlap sack, that's what the heart looks like when it's fibrillating. We all have this idea that it's not moving at all, that it's just kind of dead in the water. It's actually moving completely um, unorganized. Uh, 
completely unorganized beat that looks just like a sack full of worms or a sack full of snakes. And everybody's seen medical dramas where they put the paddles on somebody's chest and boom, or your AED uh, in the building here. That's called defibrillation. So if this is fibrillating, when you put electricity to that heart, you're defibrillating. And what do you think you're trying to do? Stop fibrillation. One of the things that happens when you stop that is it stops everything. Eventually, most of the time, if we can defibrillate within 10 minutes of the onset of fibrillation, the heart will remember, hey, I'm supposed to be. And it'll pick up its regular rhythm, and then the heart starts beating again, and the pulse comes. And you get in the newspaper on YouTube or, or whatever it is for taking your phone. So how many of you have taken a formal CPR class? Okay, AED CPR? Okay, good. I would encourage everybody um, an AED CPR class uh, because it's it's good to get the heart pumping. I mean, okay, so uh, we'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate here in a second, but if the heart isn't pumping, what are compressions? I kind of skipped ahead. What do we think those are? It's artificially Pretty making hard. the pump work. So the heart's supposed to fill with blood and empty and fill with blood and empty. Right? So when you're squeezing in a compression, when you're pushing in a compression, I'm sorry, you're compressing the heart between the sternum and the spine, and you're squishing all the blood out. And then when you let up, you're allowing it to passively fill. And then when you push down again, you're squeezing the blood out. You're making the blood go round and round, the most basic thing that we need. That's good to compress the heart and make the blood go round and round, but it might still be fibrillating. In all likelihood, it's still fibrillating. So even if you stop your compressions, the likelihood the heart is going to remember that it needs to beat again isn't very good. CPR alone will maintain someone until an AED or 911 <coughs> contact and, and an AL or advanced life support team arrives to defibrillate the patient. So that's only one piece. CPR is only one piece. AED is the other piece. And that's the most common thing that happens with the adult heart. Pediatric cases are a little different. They don't fibrillate as much as our hearts do, as adults do. Um, but, so, most everybody in here has had CPR, so the hands-only demonstration is kind of uh, redundant for you. But when we go to do demos, um, I don't know, I've done one at the mall before. Uh, we do it at the high school sometimes, just little health fairs. We'll do just a, a, a quick down and dirty, hands-only, <coughs> excuse me, compression demonstration. And that's literally what it is. So, so you come upon somebody who doesn't seem to be moving. It's best, by the way, if you see it happen, right? If you see it happen and we start CPR right away, we sustain that period of time that defibrillation is going to work quite a lot longer. So the earlier we compress, the better. So we see this guy, he falls down. Um, hey, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? There's no response. Somebody needs to call 911. Now, there's a couple of different things that we talk about in a full-blown CPR class. If this is a pediatric patient, in all likelihood, the problem is in his airway. In all likelihood, he's choking on a Tootsie Roll or he's choking on a piece of a hot dog or something like that. And so we would actually administer CPR to that pediatric kid for about a minute or two before we left to go call 911 if we couldn't pick the kid up with us and go. Well, you guys are a little bit bigger. Getting someone here to defibrillate and to help you with compressions, because by the way, your compressions are only really effective probably for two to four minutes, no matter how good a shape you're in. So getting somebody here is of, of the highest importance. If you're by yourself, an adult goes down, hey, 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 are you okay, are you okay? American Heart tells us to go get help. So go to the nearest phone, call and come back to the patient. The pediatric patient, try to resuscitate it for a little bit and then go get help. Because again, it's usually an airway problem. And that's hard to do. It's hard to imagine somebody needs my help and I think I'm just going to help. But you're actually going to get the rest of the help. Now, in your guys' situation, if, especially if you're here at work, my presumption is there's lots of folks around. So, hey, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? There's no response. Go call 911. Go get an AED. So you don't want the same person to get two tasks. Our brains don't work real well in emergencies as a species. What are we supposed to do when we're stressed? What, what is? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Sympathetic nervous system 
uh, whoever designed this said, if a saber-toothed tiger, tiger jumps out, I want you to run. And so our bodies, our, our, our nervous systems move all of our oxygen and blood to our skeletal muscles so that we can run fast. Unfortunately, what's sacrificed is oxygenated blood up here in the brain. And when somebody get locks up in an emergency or gets really anxious in an emergency, it's no personal fault of their own. It's how we're designed, by the way. We're designed to turn tail and run, survival. <laughs> Blunting that sympathetic response is what emergency workers try to do. We try to keep oxygenated blood up in our brain so we can make good decisions. So, if you tell someone, go call 911 and get me an AED, studies tell us that she'll get to the phone, she'll call 911 and go, what was that other thing I was supposed to do? I ran real fast and used up all the oxygenated blood. I remember one thing, but what was the other thing? So, go call 911, go get an AED. Um, so, the de he doesn't appear to be moving at all. Again, communities, we, we used to like check a pulse, we used to do all that. No, guy looks like he's dead. What? Okay. Start clicking. Start pumping. This doesn't click. It will. Be. This will? Yeah. Oh, will he? Oh, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> uh, the song, uh, everybody, almost everybody in here is old enough to remember the Bee Gees. Staying Alive is a good rate. Stay Alive. That beat. So is another one bites the dust. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, that's the first one. I like to stay alive. I like the conversation to stay alive. Okay. So hands-only CPR is exactly that. Hands-only CPR. That's all. And and that's really all I'm going to talk about because you guys, uh, if you've taken a CPR class, there's a review of the steps. And the conventional CPR next to it. Um, if you haven't, I would encourage you to do it. So hands-only is literally that. Push hard, push fast. If this patient doesn't sit up and slap you because you're pushing them on the chest, then you're probably doing the right thing. We used to think that we would do a ton of damage to the heart by doing compressions when the heart was beating. We might bruise the heart, but on the other hand, if it's not beating, they're going to stay dead. And so when you think of, when you balance out the risk versus benefit, hey, what the heck? Let's give it a go. So if somebody pushes you away, please stop. CPR, and I say, I say that partially in jest, but seriously. <laughs> we've had cases where we've shown up on the scene and the patient's flailing and trying to get away and somebody's saying, no, I'm giving you chest compressions. <laughs> Remember, they have to be unconscious, not moving, and appear not to be breathing before you start the hands on. okay? All right, so I'll refer now to the sheet to the, we're going to the major bleeding part. And it says major bleeding. I said major burns down here too, but again, call 911. In, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, no, you're fine. In one of my classes a long time ago, I thought I heard that during CPR, it almost likely that they throw up. Is that true? It's pop, so it depends. So a hands-only CPR, uh, less likely. If you're if you're breathing into the patient, more likely. And the reason is, and it's actually this is as, as basic as, as it is, this uh, mannequin is actually pretty good for. So. So you know that your, your trachea goes down here and then goes to your lungs, right? And, in this, and then in the same, right behind the trachea is another tube that goes to your stomach. So you get the esophagus and the trachea right next to each other. If you don't get the head, head tilt, chin lift, if you don't get the uh, head tilt uh, adjusted properly and the airway open, all that air goes into the stomach. What goes into the stomach comes out of the stomach and brings whatever happens to be in the stomach with it. So that's typically when we get uh, folks throwing up. That's usually because somebody's trying to give breaths but they're not positioning the airway appropriately and they're pushing a lot of air down. And then you start doing compressions on their chest and regular CPR and that's even more pressure to get some little projectiles on them. So can happen, hands only less likely to happen. Um, okay, so back to major bleeding. Any other questions about the CPR or hands only CPR before we move on? All right. Um, have the person lie down with their head lower than their body. Now, kind of, so what we're talking about is elevating their feet a little bit, right? Sometimes that helps, that moves the blood to the core a little bit better. <coughs> um, and sometimes that helps. 
Is that but assuming that the bleeding if the bleeding, well, if the bleeding is cut, so the other thing we'd like to do, and I don't think I put it out here, is we'd really like to move the bleeding above the level of the heart. So if it is down below and you put their feet up, that's probably not a bad thing because we're using gravity to, to, to kind of help us a little bit, keep blood in the core, and maybe uh, if the heart's pumping, if my arm's the thing that's bleeding, if my heart's pumping against gravity, it'll pump less pressure there, and so it's less likely, or it's more likely to help you with stopping. So don't remove any objects from the wound. Now, if it's gravel, and you can brush it off, Okay. And you have something to cover, I think, did I put on? Oh yeah, so put gloves on, by the way. Or if you don't have gloves, plastic sack or something. Um, I, I know you all like each other and trust each other, uh, but you never know who you're gonna be helping. Um, and there's lots of diseases out there that, that are, some of them uh, are acquired um, without risky behavior. Some of them are acquired with risky behavior, behavior, and you just, you just never know. So if you can protect yourself, that's best. You're hoping that the gloves are really just, if you've got cuts or anything on your hand and you come in contact with somebody else's blood, the possibility exists that you could become infected. So it's best to cover yourself. <coughs> so anyway, so back to this. Don't remove objects from the wound. You can brush off some gravel if you'd like, but if there's something sticking in the leg, please don't. If you remove that, it's actually going to increase bleeding. That may, might be part of what's tamponading or squeezing off the area and, and keeping it from bleeding as much. You can apply direct pressure with gauze or tourniquet. We'll look at that in a second. Your arms. My arms are bleeding? Okay. Terribly. So it's squirting. And by the way, so uh, what, what, when I say major bleeding, I mean bright red squirting blood or lots of blood flowing out. If it's just oozing, and you go to turn, put a tourniquet on somebody that's kind of overkill. <laughs> but so difference between an artery and a vein. Artery and a vein, pressure versus non-pressure. Blood has to continue to go round and round. If it all leaks out of a <coughs> hole, it's not going to go round and round again. One of the basic tenets you got to make sure it does. So arterial bleeding is bright red blood spurting, venous bleeding, which is usually more of a surface injury, uh, not quite as deep, is usually oozy. But darker typically. The scalp wounds will bleed like you wouldn't believe. There's a lot, there's a lot of blood, uh, there's a lot of vascular supply, a lot of veins and, and arteries that go up to the head because it's super important. And so, and, and that's one of the last things we kind of, your body worries about when it starts dropping its blood pressure, it tries to keep that head as, as, as pressurized as possible. And so those head wounds will, will bleed a lot. Um, so the difference between, so his, let's say his is bright red blood, uh, it's spurting. The difference between a pressure dressing versus just a plain old dressing, so here's just a plain old dressing. And if I, if I decided, it's not very sanitary now. <laughs> if I decided just to wrap it. Saves my arm, it's okay. There's not a ton, and notice I'm not being super neat, right, because he's bleeding. Oh man, but it, you know what I should have done to begin with? This is just a plain old dressing. What would be better, would be a pressure dressing. Pressure dressing is simply something folded up, placed over the area that's bleeding. So when you bring it around and you start applying pressure with the curl X or the bandage or whatever you have, there's actually more pressure on that spot. That's really all it is. I'll give this a little bit. So typically we don't reuse the <laughs> typically. Typically, sometimes, I mean. So, you know. if I were, which I was, working as, as a, whatever I was doing, building pools for a summer, and I had a, a major bleed, and, uh, and did you? We, we found uh, a, a dirty rag and some duct tape. Well, I mean, is that better than not doing anything? It's better than nothing. Okay. And, the, and the other thing I'll say about, about venous wounds, also like the slow, dark red, bleeding, sometimes it's better just to let those bleed for a little bit if it's not gushing, because that will push out any of the contaminants that you might have gotten. Uh, now, bright red blood, not, not so much. Whatever you got is probably, so even if it's a or something like that. So, if, I don't know, you guys don't have any of these, but I would suggest um, getting a couple of them for your first aid kits. So this is called a cat tourniquet, something pretty new on the market. Uh, we use them, our tactical paramedics use them for gunshot wounds. We got them in our, our arms violent intruder kits. So this is something that you can do very quickly for an arterial bleed. 
that you can't get stopped with direct pressure and that nothing else is working on. So the latest hair will go above it. It's simply the strap and then, oh, I've got to move that around so they can see. And then I'm going to apply pressure simply by twisting it and locking it in there. And the reason this is, so the band is wide, right? Because if, if I had a really, hit, like if I were using a piece of string or tenable floss, it would obviously cut through the more I tighten it. So the band is wide to apply circumferential pressure, but it's tightening enough, and I told you the arteries are a little bit deeper than the veins, that it can get all the way down to the artery to actually apply pressure. So in lieu of this, could you take your belt off? To take your belt off, you could wrap anything that is a, a little bit wider than a uh, string. You can use anything you can find, honestly. Tape. What, what is about the wide amount of compression for that? I mean, is it, should you ask the person? Should you? Well, so no. If it doesn't start, if it doesn't slow down, I'm sorry. If it doesn't slow down breathing, you can tighten it. Or breathing, bleeding, you can tighten it. And you just tighten it until it slows down. I mean, basically, you're balancing the the possible of tissue damage by cutting off all the blood flow versus possibility of brain and heart damage by losing blood pressure and oxygenated blood. We say organ versus organism. You're choosing to sacrifice, you know, and, and honestly, um, you know, uh, every once in a while you see on the news somebody's had a farm accident and both their arms get ripped off and six hours later they're able to reattach their arms and they can actually use them. So tissue is really good about maintaining its, its viability after a pretty extended period of time. Organs aren't. Uh, kidneys, brain, heart are the most uh, susceptible to oxygen uh, deprivation, but if, if, if this appeared dead, a vascular surgeon could probably do something with it so there was some use. If this appears dead, there's not a whole lot anybody can do about it. So <laughs> organ versus organism, sometimes you have to sacrifice. So if, if, if major bleeding is caused by, like you said, an amputation of an extremity, now an arm is an extreme example, but I know someone who lost a finger, their ring got caught on the slide going down with their child and just ripped oh, the finger off. Oh. Um, so, I, the, the, so, do you need to put that on ice? Is that true? Does that help that uh, at all? Or? Uh, I would have books. I can tell you some horror stories about folks putting stuff on ice. Putting it on ice and keeping it cool is okay as long as there's something around it before you put it on ice. Because so the tissue. we understand what keeps you warm is the blood circulating through your own uh, your metabolism that's moving around and your and your body's getting rid of your body heat through your circulated blood. If you've amputated a part, there's no blood circulating through it, so it's not warm. So if you lay it on directly on ice, what you see in the winter time with um, uh, frostbite happens very quickly with tissue that doesn't have any circulation in. So wrap it in something you can place it in a cooler but don't put the part directly on ice keeping it cool is fine um, but what's more important is kind of protecting it wrapping it up okay i've always wondered about this but if you came across somebody who say or had a wound and they took it out first of all That's uh, yeah. That's, I heard that somewhere, so I wasn't sure. Uh, our role, our role of curl act, uh, I mean, is essentially that. And if it's a big wound, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, and the blood will soak that up, and it'll actually expand it just like it does, and it will tamponade that off. Tamponade. Interesting that you asked that question. No, no. That, that, the, the word we we use when we're talking about slowing the bleeding is to tamponade it off, and so. That's why. <laughs> there you go. So absolutely. You learned something today. Absolutely. All right. Um, this also I would suggest for first aid kits. Uh, we used to use the the uh, more rigid splints, the uh, the ladder splints, or like a big long leg splint or something. This Sam splint is fairly new on the market. It probably about 15 years on, but it's very malleable, malleable. It's very usable, and we like to when there's a fracture. We like to splint something in a position of function. So you're kind of that way, grab that. We'd like to split it, in a, split it in a position of function if at all possible. Just because it's more comfortable and blood flows much more nicely than this one way through. And I'd curl it over. And then I would simply 
use the Curlex around to uh, <coughs> to take care of that arm fracture. Um, so if it's a compound fracture and you see bone sticking out, do you mess with that? Um, no. you so again, if, image? if it's a if it's a fracture and there's nobody around and there's no 911 that you can dial, you can help splint it and restore blood flow to the hand. But especially if it's a compound pound fracture, that's an open fracture, bone in sticking out, don't do anything with it. Just you may have to control bleeding because a compound fracture will probably bleed pretty well. But direct pressure on a compound compound fracture hurts and probably where your tourniquet would be much better use um, above the so area. for a leg compound the fracture areas, they were that put me on and yeah. it up. So you use a belt or if you don't have that you know that's a garter, you know. Um, so that if, if they were you know you trying to transport yourself or should you know say you've got a kid that breaks their leg playing soccer and it just yeah. Compounds. No, absolutely call it ambulance. It all depends on what what resources you have available and what, what you can get from there. But I, I can't think of. I suppose if you're playing soccer um, in the at a campsite that's 45 minutes away from any emergency medical care, you, you might uh, try to split that thing. But um, so well, nine, if you call 911 immediately, will they tell you an accurate ETA so that you can say? All right, well, if it's going to take you 20 minutes, it, I'm going right now it, myself. You know, you can probably ask. I, it's a pretty good get. The standard is nine minutes from the point of your pole to the point where we get there. Now, we've got about a six or seven minute here, um, but standard around the country, everybody shoots for about nine minutes. If you're very rural, um, I, I doubt they would be able to give you a real estimate. Okay. But, it's not like pizza. It's not free. My trip is free. So, all right, so there's major bleeding. Uh, I did want to mention strokes. Um, I'm kind of jumping around to make sure we get a couple of these. I did want to mention strokes and heat strokes. So, I told you that um, I'm done with you for a bit. Uh, Good. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I said that. So if there's an obstruction to, to, to actual circulation within the heart itself, it causes a heart attack. If there's an obstruction to circulating blood, oxygenated blood in the brain, we tried for a while to call it a brain attack, but for whatever reason, that didn't catch on. And stroke had already started, but it's exactly what it is. It's an infarct is what it's called. There's a, there's a myocardial infarct, right, if, you're, if the vessels in, inside your heart have a blockage in them, and it can't oxygenate itself. That's a heart attack, a myocardial infarct. Myocardium is your heart, infarct is just the blockage. A brain infarct is a stroke, it's the same thing. Blood vessels inside your brain, there's a blockage, and, uh, and blood can't, oxygenated blood can't get past it to oxygenate some other area of your brain. <laughs> One of the most, so if I show up on the scene, we do a, a, a Cincinnati stroke scale assessment, and we ask the patient, First thing we do is I look at his face and I see whether or not um, it's symmetrical. So most of the time, sometimes in a stroke, one side of the body is affected and the other is not. And you might have a, a, a grimace, as we call it. There might be a face, uh, a face drooping on one side or the other. So, and I can't really approximate it very well, but you ask them to smile. Show me your teeth. And if they can only smile on one side, that's a positive Cincinnati stroke scale. That's a positive for a probable stroke. And I ask them to hold out their hands. I ask them to close their eyes and turn palms up. If you've had a stroke, it's difficult to tell, for you to tell where your arms are in space, with, especially with your eyes closed. So if your eyes are closed, if this is called arm drift, that's kind of a positive sometimes for a stroke. Then I usually will ask them a question. That they have slurred speech, and I don't suspect that there's any alcohol or drugs or anything involved. That's a positive sign for a possible stroke. So all those things say this patient needs to go to a stroke center. And, by, and, and I didn't mention it, but uh, St. Mary's here in town is also uh, a cardiac care center. So they're, they're a STEMI center, as we call it. So it's where you can go for a heart attack, but you can also, they're also a stroke center. You can go there for a stroke. Step one with that blockage, the treatment of the stroke, is to give you something that thins your blood so that clot might dissolve and blood will get past, 
past it, past that vessel that's blocked. It's the most important thing. We can't do that in the field. And then I'll tell you a reason why here in a second. Stroke center is the only place that can do it. So you roll into a stroke center, we, and we actually call ahead and we say I have a possible stroke. They get the, the uh, CT scanner ready uh, for us. Um, we roll in, uh, we, take some, we usually take some blood from you to do a test, I'll tell you here in a second. We roll in, they take you directly to the CT scanner, and they're looking to make sure that the type of stroke you're having is a blockage and not a bleed. So sometimes the little vessels can break in your brain. Same thing happens as far as the same symptoms occur many times. It looks like a stroke. But if it's a bleed and we give you something that will thin your blood, that falls into the bad category, right? That would make you bleed more <laughs> into your brain. So we can't just arbitrarily say, you're having stroke-like symptoms, therefore I'm going to give you this fibrinolytic, as it's called. I'm going to give you this blood thinner. And we'll just throw it on everybody. Well, if you're having a bleed instead of a blockage, I'm doing you no good, I'm actually harming you. So when you get to the emergency room, you're going straight into the CT so they can look inside your skull and see if you're bleeding. If you're not bleeding, they take the blood that we collected and they look to see how well you're clotting, how well your blood is clotting. They're just checking your clotting factor. And if it's within a certain range, then they give you blood thinners. And that's fibrillinic therapy is very, very successful with strokes where there's a blockage. If you're having a bleed, you're going someplace other than St. Mary's. We'll be taking you downtown, probably St. Luke's on the Plaza, for research. I think it's a comprehensive stroke center where they can do brain surgery as well. Yes? If you are at your house and you think somebody's having a stroke or a heart attack, and an ambulance comes and gets you, do they know where to take you, like the stroke center? Or do you have to tell them? So I can only speak for my district. It's, it's, it's many times it's about the um, but they should. They do, we do here. We know where the stroke centers are, we know where the trauma centers are, we know where the STEMI centers are. We know where we can take folks, where we should and shouldn't take folks. So there's actually state regulations, it's called TCD regulations, time critical diagnosis. So if you have a heart attack or you have a stroke or you're having major trauma, all three of those things are time critical, right? getting you someplace definitive care that's critical. So there are regulations in the state about where to take. First of all, where we take as EMS, and secondly, what the hospitals have to comply with to be a stroke STEMI or a trauma center. There are certain things that they have to be able to do as well. So ambulance crews should know. They should. You, that's nothing that you should have to worry about figuring out. So what makes a heat stroke different from a regular stroke? Uh, so, just like there were three different levels of, uh, like the heart attack thing, I said angina, uh, I said uh, uh, heart attack, and then I said cardiac arrest. There are kind of three different levels of heat stroke. There's heat cramps. Heat cramps is a big red flag, your body waving, saying, by the way, there's not enough fluid in here. It could be an electrolyte imbalance. I mean, it could, that could have more to do with it, but in, but in all likelihood, if your volume, if your if your uh, blood volume were sufficient, that is you've been drinking enough water replenishing what you're sweating out, that electrolyte imbalance wouldn't affect you as much with cramps. So cramps is like number one. If you're getting a cramp, you need to drink some water. Now, the problem is it takes a little while. Um, so in the summertime, I do a youth boot camp and it's hot outside. And we tell the kids to start doing, uh, start drinking water, the week before they come to camp. So they're hydrated when they come in. If you try to just hydrate as soon as you, oh, I got that cramp. I'm gonna go give me some Gatorade because I got a cramp. Bad. Is anybody here at all? I'm only you probably not. So I play football in high school and every time I got a cramp, you run to the side of the coach, you got a cramp. Give me some salt tablets. Here you go, take a salt tablet. They stopped that practice yeah. before I got to do Take a salt tablet. Well, there's, there, so where does water go? Does everybody remember their high school chemistry or high school biology? Where does water go? Does it go to a higher concentration or a lower concentration? There's a really concentrated salt and electrolyte in your stomach. It actually pulls water from the rest of your tissue to dilute that high concentration. And then it goes from your stomach to your intestines and then you pee it out. 
So it makes you more dehydrated. If you start out dehydrated and you get a cramp, and then you drink a bunch of Gatorade, which by the way has a ton of sodium and a ton of potassium, those electrolytes we need, right? But if they're concentrated in your stomach, it's actually pulling water out and you're peeing it out. This, oh, I'm going to the bathroom, I must be okay. No, your, your cells, your tissues actually need that fluid. So just because you're peeing and just because, oh, I got a Gatorade, doesn't mean uh, necessarily that you're hydrated, in all likelihood you're not. If you get a cramp and you're worried about your hydration level, I would suggest water or Gatorade cut. So half and half, half water, half Gatorade. For every drink of water you take, take a drink of Gatorade, uh, however you do it. But you shouldn't, you really shouldn't have that hyper-concentrated electrolyte stuff without and all the calories and sugar too. I mean, plus, I mean, talk about that. That makes it, it's called hypertonic. It's very concentrated and it draws water right to wherever it is. And if it, in your stomach, uh, again, what we would like to do is we'd like to have something hypotonic. We'd like to drink something like water that doesn't have any salt in it. And so the tissue around the water has more salt in it. And so the water goes out of your stomach and out of your intestines, actually out of your intestines, into your tissue where it belongs rather than just going straight through the plumbing in to out. So. Okay, so that's just over with cramps. Cramps was uh, step one of heat stroke. The next one is heat exhaustion, and that's about the time where somebody goes, oh my cramps. Oh, I cramped a little bit earlier, but I'm a little dizzy. That's heat exhaustion. Typically, we differentiate heat exhaustion and heat stroke by how well you can talk to me, we have a level of consciousness. If you can't remember where you are, um, that you're at work or you came to work, what you have for breakfast, what your name is, what your children's name are, something like that, you're probably in the heat stroke range and outside of the heat exhaustion range. At that point where you start getting a little bit dizzy, that's hard to gather your thoughts, you're probably pretty securely in the heat exhaustion. So, so from cramps to heat exhaustion, I feel a little dizzy, Heat stroke, patient's unconscious. That patient has stopped sweating probably. Symptomatically, the person with cramps is sweating. The person with heat exhaustion is sweating a lot. The person with heat stroke probably is not sweating at all. There may be sweat on them, <coughs> right, because they pass through the two previous stages, but they're not actively sweating like I am now. They're not, <laughs> they're not actively sweating. They've lost their ability to do that. The body can no longer regulate its own temperature, and so no sweat is being produced. That's life-threatening. It's every bit as life-threatening as a stroke or a heart attack. So, um, if you're looking for a hallmark, I wish to say uh, that person really needs to get inside and get cool. It would it would definitely be heat cramps. is time to take a break. Heat exhaustion is time to go home and recuperate because we don't want to get the heat stroke. And then once you've had the heat exhaustion, it takes a couple of days because you have to replenish. It takes a week really to get you up to a balance, but if you've had that serious of an, an exhaustive uh, 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 emergency, it takes you a couple of days even to get back up where it's really safe to expose yourself to heat more. How quickly can you progress from cramps to stroke? Um, it's tough to say it's different for everybody. It would depend probably on your hydration status to begin with, but it could be, I wouldn't say it's minutes. I would say you probably could go from one to the, from the beginning to end, as it were, probably with an hour under the right or wrong circumstances. Um, I'm guessing. Um, any questions about heat? So what do we do? But, uh, IV? Uh, what do you do? Oh. <laughs> huh? Cool them, right? And so this person who has heat exhaustion, probably you take them inside and say you need to sit down and start hydrating. Uh, and like I said, they probably shouldn't be exposed for, to the heat for the, at least the rest of the day, if not a couple of days. The heat stroke guy, call 911, try to cool them. And, and I would even suggest for the heat exhaustion person, probably shouldn't call 911. But uh, the heat uh, stroke guy, you try to cool him. You gotta be careful though. 
And uh, we say take them inside if you can. If it's unconscious, it might be difficult. You can put a damp, and I put it on there. You can put a damp sheet, like soak it in water and kind of lay it on try to cool them. But be careful. Don't leave it there for long, and when we get there, we're probably going to take it off. They've lost all ability to regulate their internal temperature. So a wet blanket left on them actually might throw them into hypothermia instead of hyperthermia. So hyper is high, thermia is temperature. If they have a very high temperature, it's hyperthermic. If they have a very low temperature because we've put this wet blanket on them and we've left it on them uh, and they start shivering, um, they could go hypothermic as well just because they've lost all ability to regulate them. Part of their brain just didn't work in the way it's supposed to. So call 911, cool them carefully, uh, and then definitely get them out of the sun if you can at all. Moving air across them is good. I wouldn't suggest dousing them. I wouldn't suggest putting them into ice cold water. Again, for the same reason, because their temperature regulatory mechanisms are kaput, and they'll, they'll go the other direction. Questions about heat stroke? Done? I don't believe that. Um, let's see. Wow, I might get drilled. <laughs> Uh, choking, uh, and those are just really general statements uh, on this that everybody understands what the Heimlich is, right? It's, I mean, it's like probably one of the most successful. It was the abdominal thrust. One of the most successful uh, um, um, marketing campaigns in the history of the world is two of One's the Heimlich, the other one is stop, drop, and roll, probably. But yes, they're abdominal. It, so if the patient is alert and the patient is standing up and grabbing their throat and they're and they're saying or they're not saying anything. Um, then the Heimlich is appropriate. That's trying to get that, that piece of Now, if they're unconscious, uh, chest compressions and abdominal thrust, just like you learned in your CPR class, if, um, depending upon their age. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Heimlich and unconscious don't perform, lie on their back. Sometimes when you lay somebody down, it'll dislodge the item. Uh, whatever it is in there, I'm not suggesting you stick your fingers in there to check, but you might be able to see it, and if you can see it, you can probably pull it out. Um, and then, yeah. standing a kid on a chair sometimes, if they're like uh, like a 10-year-old or, or an 8-year-old, you, you either get on your knees to try and dislodge if Again, they're conscious, they're grabbing their throat, they're not moving in the air, not talking. You can have them stand on a chair so they're positioned a little bit better. You can get on your knees behind them and do the same thing. Each thrust, though, whether it's an abdominal thrust, is they're unconscious, or it's the Heimlich, as everybody understands it, is a specific attempt to clear that airway. So it's not just a... <coughs> no, you're thrusting up and out with some force, and you're trying to get them to expel that. You're, you're, you're make, putting pressure behind the cork, as it were, trying to get that cork to pop out. What if someone were... Uh too girthy to perform this maneuver. Well, then place your hands higher at the base of the breastbone, so you go a little bit higher. So they're either girthy because of diet exercise or lack thereof, or um, they're pregnant. So you go above uh, the girth, and you do pretty much the same thing. Again, each thrust is an attempt to uh, to expel the object. But somebody's got cold night one. If you're by yourself, again, this is an instance in which you might be able to make, and this is why I put like a minute or two, try to dislodge it like for a minute or two if you're by yourself before you actually have to leave the patient. Um, if they're unconscious you and they're an adult, you leave the patient, go call 911. If there's somebody else there, go call 911 and what the heck, this isn't going well, bring me an AED as well. Okay? Is it true that if you're caught, if you're coughing, you are breathing? And so if that, somebody that is out, true, but I think I did put the a lot of person to cough to clear their own airway. If they're coughing, they're breathing. If they're able to say, "I'm not choking," <laughs> they're not choking. <laughs> now, gasps, um, agonal breathing, high-pitched whistling, you know, uh, those sometimes are described as a partial or near complete airway obstruction. Those could be interpreted, especially the high pitched whistling. If there's air coming out that's just going, that you treat that as a full obstruction. Um, but if they can talk, if they can cough with some, with any force at all, then they're they're clearing it themselves. The 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 designers 
way of telling us that things don't belong in our lungs other than air is, is a laryngospasm. So you know your vocal cords are in your larynx and anytime anything touches those that's not air, they spasm, slam shut. And it takes a couple of seconds before a lot of times that laryngospasm will relax and you can actually get air by and get it into your lungs. It's one of the reasons why people that drown sometimes float. If the water got in quick enough, it will cause that laryngospasm to occur. Air trapped in their lungs, they'll float for a little bit. Eventually, laryngospasm uh, relaxes, the whole body fills with water, and then it sinks to the bottom. Um, but it's God's way of saying that doesn't belong there. When you cough, when you can't breathe, it shuts it off. So nothing else gets in there for the time being, not even air, until they're sure that, uh, until your body's sure that that's all it's good. So yeah, as long as they're coughing or they're able to, able to cough in a second or two, you know, if they water goes down the wrong pipe and they're doing that for give them a second, <laughs> don't immediately run behind them. I don't know. They might be able to take a breath in just a second or two. Um, but yeah, if they're coughing, they're probably going to be okay. Any other questions about choking? No. Uh, so we did two, okay, shock, and I just that's just like a real general thing. Um, it could be like, make it be, it could be shock, like I didn't know you were my father. Uh, <laughs> and it caused somebody to collapse, and, I, and I'm being completely serious. Uh, or um, something as shocky as a low blood volume, right, and blood not going round and round very well that could cause shock. One's a psychological thing. The other one's a physiological. The shock of, um, I, I didn't know you're my father, may cause something called vasodilation. Oh my God! When you stand up too fast, sometimes that causes vasodilation. That means, hey Mario, take the lid off so I don't touch the top so I get a little gooey. Alright, so if if your blood volume is usually like this, when you stand up too fast, your blood vessels sometimes expand. Or when you're surprised they expand, suddenly your blood vessels are bigger and the volume that was okay a minute ago is no longer and there's no blood up here. And that's when they, we have a syncopus or that's when they faint sometimes. So that's kind of a psychological thing. When that container starts out half empty, that's physiological. When somebody has bled out, right? and we have to fill it back up by starting an IV, um, that's a different kind of shock. In both instances, keep the patient warm, somebody stand with them. Sometimes they're going to vomit, try to roll them over on their side as long as they don't have like a fence post sticking out of their leg that you're banging on the ground as you're trying to roll them over. Really be careful, um, but uh, stay with them. And again, somebody call 911. We don't know the reason for their shocking condition usually right away. We'll put a monitor on them, we'll take a look at their heart, we'll do a Cincinnati stroke scale, we'll take some vital signs, we'll probably start an IV and give them some medications, and then by the time we're done, we may still not know <laughs> why they're kind of shocked. But, but the big thing is to protect their airway, make sure that they're, con or at least they're, they're breathing, and make sure, you know, check every now and then if you think they've got a pulse. Keep them warm, and if they vomit again, roll on their side. What else? You guys are really attentive, I think. I have some, I have some questions about, yeah. like, uh, ticks, spider bites, things of that sort. What, I mean, I've seen necrosis from a spider bite that makes this lunch not want to sit well. So what are things that you can do if, if you suspect that, or snake bites, something of that sort? Uh, so, back to your old Boy Scout or um, health class, the, the, the vipers, the, pit, the, the ones with the pits in there, Mouths are the ones that actually have venom, the venomous ones. You can't necessarily always tell, and so if you're snake bit, I would suggest a tourniquet and, and attention. Usually, if you're snake bit and it is venomous, you'll know something right away. Because it, it either, depending on what, which snake it is, it either burns a lot, hurts a lot, or it numbs immediately, depending upon what the venom does with that particular snake. Is. Um, there has not been a snake bite death in the state of Missouri that I'm aware of in a very long time. Um, so, tr 
try not to get excited because again, the more you get excited, blood goes running around quicker. Um, and if there is going to be a negative reaction, that venom it's going to get distribute throughout your body a little bit more quickly and reach your heart a little bit more quickly. But tourniquet's a good idea, a belt or whatever you have to try to keep that blood compartmentalized if you really think it was poisonous and then get some place. There are like three or four anti-venom kits in the metro that's out infrequently. Um, now, uh, brown recluse spiders, again, don't kill you right away unless you got like a whole bunch of them. And the necrosis that he's talking about, that's the spider bite that just, the, the, from the middle of the bite, outward, that venom causes tissue to die. And you look at it, it's usually gray or white or sometimes even black in the middle and then it gets, uh, and then it gets a little bit pink and then red and then finally normal skin tone all the way out. Kind of almost like a, almost like a target. The further close you get to the middle, the wider and deader the skin is. The further out you get, it's called induration, the redder it gets, and then it turns into normal skin. That will continue to grow unless you probably go get uh, some attention. They usually give you a steroid or a metro dose pack or something like that. Again, people typically don't die from brown recluse bites. They're nasty. I can't think of any any case that, I've, that I'm aware of, certainly in recent years. And there was one quite a while ago, there were a ton of brown recluse bites. And the cumulative effect of venom eventually in the patient. There's an element of Not around here, I think it was in East Side. Um, so, buck repellent. Um, depending upon your beliefs, it's a good, it's a good thing. I don't like using it, um, so I make sure whenever I go out in, in the, uh, whatever I mow or whatever, as soon as I get done mowing, I have a towel and I rub my, you know, I drop everything I'm wearing and I rub myself down with my towel to make sure anything that might be on there I get off right away. And uh, and I, I don't have, a, I don't, I, I, can't, I don't like off. I personally don't like off. My grandfather. My father both had really bad cases of skin cancer, um, and I, anything that I'm applying that's chemical based to my skin, um, it just makes me nervous. Then I got a lot of moles. If you can. What about sunburns? I absolutely protect myself from sunburns as much as I can. Um, that's uh, they do another really good marketing campaign is, is sunscreen. But sunscreen is also a chemical, and so I, I simply wear a hat or clothing. Um, if I do apply sunscreen, it's only to my arm. I just try to wear a hat and uh, long sleeves my hand. Because I'm susceptible to skin cancer just by my history. And I've been pretty lucky. I've had a couple of places that cut up. Nothing, nothing bad. Anybody else have any questions?